He kōna e ipurangi tēnei nā te reo irirangi o Aotearoa. On Friday, March 15th, I was walking the Rootburn track with my girlfriend. We were away three days, swimming in Lake Mackenzie, watching Kia stalk unattended backpacks, listening to tourists gush about how beautiful and peaceful and lucky this country is. Then on Saturday afternoon, we walked out of the bush and met our bus on the Milford Tiano Highway. Just as the bus got underway, the driver made an announcement over the intercom. She said, I've got some really bad news for everyone. And that's how I found out about what happened in Christchurch. When we got back into cell phone range, we jumped onto the internet. My girlfriend was looking at a Reddit thread on the shooting, and I was reading over her shoulder. And I saw this one comment which really stuck out at me. This is not what New Zealand is. New Zealand is a land of peace where all, regardless of race and religion, are welcome. Violence, racism, and discrimination are not welcome and do not define who or what New Zealand is. And I get what that person's trying to say, but for the last three years on Black Sheep, I've been looking at violent, racist, discriminatory New Zealanders. John Bryce, the racist Native Affairs Minister. James Brendergast, the Supreme Court judge who said the Treaty of Waitangi was a simple nullity. Roy Corlander, the New Zealand soldier who literally joined Nazi Germany's Waffen-SS. These people don't define New Zealand but they do represent a significant force in New Zealand history. White supremacy. In this episode, we're going to talk about white supremacy. You might be wondering why. What's the point in knowing about the history of this ideology? Well, for one thing, several New Zealand Muslims have linked the attacks in Christchurch to our history of white supremacy. One of them's Lamia Imam. We can't sit back and say, hey, because we're a country that's a country in the middle of the Pacific and we're super laid back and people are very friendly and nice, which, by the way, all of that is true, um, that we are somehow exempt from these prejudices and these institutional hate that we have towards other groups. We're just as susceptible to it because, you know, essentially we're the victims of the same idea, right? It's sort of like when we talk about our river is being polluted, right? There's a sort of sense in New Zealand, don't say that too loudly, that's going to affect our tourism. Everybody thinks we're this clean, pristine, 100% pure country, right? Um, I would say that we should be learning more about our history. I don't think the curriculum in schools necessarily go into all of the history of racism and white supremacy in New Zealand. So my view would be that if we're going to tackle this, we're going to have to start from the very, very beginning. Another reason is that white supremacists use history. They use it as a weapon. They deliberately warp New Zealand's past to fit their ideology. This is what inspired historian Scott Hamilton to start writing about the history of white supremacy. It all goes back to the time when I was finishing my PhD and I was working at uh, Auckland War Memorial Museum. And I was working for a while there on an information desk and it was a great job, but one of the things that I really noticed is the number of people who would come into the museum with very strange questions about New Zealand history. They revolved around a belief that uh, thousands of years ago a white civilization existed in New Zealand and that Maori were latecomers. Uh, another set of questions concerned the Moriori and they involved a recapitulation of the Moriori myth, the myth that uh, there was a pre-Maori Melanesian people. These myths don't just exist in books. There have been several TV documentaries. This one was uploaded to YouTube in 2015, and it's been viewed by more than 600,000 people. There are legendary stories of little blonde fairy people living in hobbit-like burrows and red-haired giants thundering across the landscape. Do these have any factual basis? 
Or are they all just fairy stories? Spoiler, yes, they are fairy stories. There is absolutely no archaeological evidence of any people living in New Zealand before Māori arrived around 800 years ago. And that myth has been uh, discredited in academia for 90 years, but it persists uh, amongst a worrying sort of a slice of the, the public. There are even a few former leaders of major political parties who have been swept along. And everyone knows conspiracy theories make good entertainment. That's why the History Channel is wall-to-wall with ancient aliens, and it's part of why people keep resurrecting myths about Mordiori or ancient Celtic civilizations today. But Scott Hamilton says there's also a much more sinister angle to the promotion of these myths. As I researched them and tried to rebut them, I realised that they were being actively promoted by a network of people who had connections with the international neo-Nazi movement. And uh, I was very concerned about the numbers of New Zealanders who uh, are acquiring a really radically false sense of their history and not actually understanding that this myth that they're buying into actually comes from people who think that Adolf Hitler was a nice guy. I mean, what is the link there? Because, like, I sort of don't quite see the benefit to white supremacy in believing these these things. The racist right in New Zealand has always had the difficulty that they can't really say brown people go home if, if brown people are the indigenous inhabitants of these islands. And so... For a lot of them, it's 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 quite important to push this myth. And the man who started it is Kerry Bolton, who's one of New Zealand's um, longest-serving neo-Nazis. He had an organisation called the Nationalist Workers' Party. He was also, for a while, the secretary of the National Front. He's a very prolific writer for international neo-Nazi websites. And he, in the 1980s, uh, produced a self-published book which argued that before Maori lived here, uh, there was a, a white tribe which had its origins in the Northern Hemisphere. This was then taken up by a guy called Martin Dutre, who produced the best-known work on the subject, Ancient Celtic New Zealand. And this is a book, if you talk to provincial librarians, you will hear that this book is re- requested a lot. There's a lot of interest in it from Pākehā who believe that it gives the true history of their country. And people like uh, Bolton and Dutre have you know, explain the lack of acceptance of their theories in academia in terms of a conspiracy. And they talk about a conspiracy to hide the evidence of this ancient civilization. Um, they talk about the skeletons of ancient white inhabitants being hidden or even destroyed. Um, they talk about an ancient stone city in the Waipua Forest in Northland, which is supposedly off limits to researchers, when the reality is it was surveyed by archaeologists three decades ago. So they, they produce these quite elaborate conspiracy theories, and they explain the conspiracy by saying that if uh, white people were revealed to be the indigenous people of New Zealand, then the Treaty of Waitangi would be null and void, and uh, the status of Maori would be much diminished. I don't want to spend any more time debunking the conspiracy theories of New Zealand's neo-Nazis. Instead, I want to look at where this ideology came from. How it's evolved over time. And how people have resisted it. The first thing to say is that white supremacy has been in New Zealand ever since there have been white people in New Zealand. In 1768, Captain James Cook set sail on what was publicly billed as a mission of science and discovery. The endeavour had astronomers on board who were there to chart the transit of Venus. There were botanists and naturalists hoping to document new plant and animal species. And that's all very admirable. But there were also a lot of soldiers. And as soon as he left port in the UK... Captain Cook opened sealed secret orders from the British Navy which outlined another mission. A mission to claim land for the British Empire. Here's historian Mark Darby. If you read Cook's journals, it's 
remarkable to note how many references there are to musket fire, to the use of cannon, to the use of military force in his engagements and his dealings with Maori. And it's pretty clear that this was in accord with the instructions that he was following, that it was, among other things, a naval expedition designed to impose some degree of military force over the area. Tasman's voyage earlier was uh, was different, but nonetheless he also engaged really violently with the Maori that he encountered. And so whether we like it or not, and obviously none of us do like it really, this country's colonial history is founded to a considerable extent on the idea that white people have a right and a duty to impose their will on the non-white people that they encountered here. James Cook's a complicated character. There are historians out there who believe Cook was relatively enlightened in his dealings with Māori, and there were at least a few occasions where it looks like cultural misunderstandings led Māori to act aggressively towards the endeavour. But military force and violence is only part of the story. Auckland University Pro Vice-Chancellor Damon Salesa points out that colonial white supremacy had other weapons which were used in the Pacific. The guns and cannons were less effective as an imperial instrument than things like the law and parliament. What we can notice about voyages like Cook's and others, including the French and Dutch voyages, is that behind them was this view that people you might find who were not European did not have the same claim on land or the places that they actually lived that someone who just happened upon them. And that very clear, unequal and racially guided view was an important part of you know, European imperial practice, that others did not have the same rights, the same abilities and the same recognition as Europeans did. Of course, colonial laws weren't just tools of white supremacy. I mean, just look at the Treaty of Waitangi. It's a document that emphasises partnership and equality between races. The officials who drafted the treaty were under strict instructions from the colonial office to act fairly in their dealings with Māori. All dealings with the Aborigines for their lands must be conducted on the same principles of sincerity, justice and good faith as must govern your transactions with them for the recognition of Her Majesty's sovereignty in the islands. Nor is this all. They must not be permitted to enter into any contracts in which they might be ignorant and unintentional authors of injuries to themselves. You also have the Wairo affray a few years later where the governor rules with Māori and against white settlers, even after Māori had executed some of those settlers in cold blood. Dr Leone Pihama is director of Te Kotahi Research Institute at the University of Waikato. She says these more positive interactions between Māori and British authorities were influenced by British humanitarians. We're in a context of a wider global imperialism, right? Native American people had already, you know, hundreds of years before, uh, been impacted uh, by colonialism. Uh, Aboriginal Australia had been impacted by colonialism. And so already in London there are humanitarian groups that were already saying, well, actually, what you did here and there we don't want you to be doing the same. We want to have some kind of facilitation in this particular land. I mean, the other thing I t- in terms of, uh, you know, Te Tira Te is actually in the signing, our people were quite visionary in seeing that these new people were bringing a ways of being that in the future could be potentially destructive for our people. And so the treaty is also a reflection of our ancestors believing we needed to put something in place that ensured, one, the sovereignty of our people was maintained and recognised, and two, that the those that had arrived could govern over their own people who were kind of running riots. But the power of these humanitarian ideas didn't last long. Very soon after the signing of Te Tiriti o Waitangi, we see the start of the New Zealand Wars. And Scott Hamilton says that from the very beginning, those wars were justified through white supremacist ideas. Alfred Domit, who was 
New Zealand's premier uh, during the first stage of the Waikato War. Uh, he was very much attuned to new scientific developments in Britain, and he was very much interested in uh, misusing Darwin's ideas and creating a sort of um, homegrown scientific or pseudo-scientific racism. This argument that there is a sort of formal hierarchy of races and these races have a destiny and that uh, the white race is destined to triumph over the brown race. There obviously were forms of prejudice earlier, but they weren't um, given this kind of pseudo-scientific gloss. The super short version of the New Zealand wars is that they were often brutal and horrifically unjust. They involve attacks on unarmed civilians and scorched earth, indiscriminate raids. And a big part of how all this stuff was justified was through pseudoscientific ideas on race. I mean, at the extreme end, we have people like the mercenary Gustavus von Temsky saying that Māori didn't feel the pain of bullet wounds the same as white people. But these views weren't universal. Large numbers of British soldiers in the New Zealand wars complained about the injustice and brutality inflicted on Māori. This sentiment was particularly strong among the Irish troops, who made up about a third of the British army in New Zealand during the Waikato and Taranaki wars. Here's how one Irish soldier is reported to have expressed it. Begora, it's a murder to shoot them. Sure, they're our own people, with their potatoes and fish and children. Who knows? But they are Irishmen, with faces a little darkened by the sun, who escaped during the persecutions of Cromwell. Dr Leonie Pihama. The Irish are a particular kind of people in Europe, right? So the Irish were also colonised by the British. And so there's, there's a kind of similarity in many contexts. Even though Irish people are white people, they're also people that were very marginalised within their own space and within their own lands over a period of time. Uh, the language was marginalised, the language was denied. Uh, you know, so there's a lot of similarities, I think. It wasn't just the Irish. Even the leader of the British Army, General Gordon Cameron, is said to have been disgusted by the way the war was being pushed along for the benefit of white settlers. But Dr Pihama says it's important to keep these dissenters in context. You know, there are a number of individuals that were not okay with what was happening and voiced that. But the ideology underpinning it remains the same. So we can't look at individuals as the examples or small pockets of dissent. They're like the exception to the rule. The rule still stands. After the war was handed over to the settler government and the British Army left, things only got more brutal. At one point in Titukawaru's war, you see troops being offered bounties for the severed heads of Taranaki Māori. Scott Hamilton again. As the century draws to a close and you have this terrible demographic decline uh, amongst Māori and the population is shrinking, you have the, the rise of that terrible phrase, uh, smoothing the pillow of a dying race, which was often used by colonists, this belief that um, Māori were doomed to die out uh, by scientific laws. This assumption that the decline of Māori was natural allowed Pākehā politicians to ignore and excuse the policies which were actually causing the decline of Māori. The fact that taking Māori land contributed to poverty and malnutrition, that the refusal to give Māori equal access to health care was contributing to disease. You have this justification for all these policies which are leading to this terrible population decline in pseudoscientific terms. So for me, that's a, a really significant thread of discourse that runs through Pakeha New Zealand in the second half of the 19th century. And I think it's been taken up. Uh, well, I, I, don't, I don't even know that it ever died out in the 20th century, but certainly it's been taken up with a vengeance by white supremacists in the 21st century. But just to go back to the New Zealand wars for a second, it's worth pointing out that white supremacy cut both ways. It didn't just hurt Māori, it also hurt the British. In fact, in quite a few cases, it gets a lot of British people killed. Rua Pika Pika, Ohioai, Gait Pa, Te Nutu o Te Manu. These are all battles where supposedly superior British troops massively underestimate Māori. They didn't realise that Māori were building sophisticated defensive fortifications, trenches and artillery bunkers. 
The British bombard these par with cannon and mortar and then advance en masse, only to be gunned down in huge numbers by Māori warriors who'd been sheltering underground. Mark Darby again. Those early assumptions that a well-trained British force is not going to have any difficulty against a bunch of savages it was completely turned on its head by the facts. And, and sort of same, making the same mistakes over and over again in that assumption. Yeah, they still hadn't learned them by the time they attacked the heights at Gallipoli in, in 1914. They thought the Turks would turn and run for Istanbul as soon as they saw the British coming. didn't happen. They were defeated with, with very, very heavy losses. I think at least part of, of, uh, of that dreadful defeat was a lingering version of this notion of, of um, fundamental British superiority of arms. It's popular among white supremacists today to take a skewed view of the New Zealand wars. The idea that this was a straight-up race war. Māori lost, Pākehā won, end of the story, Māori just need to get over it. That's not what happened. For one thing, there were a lot of Māori fighting for the government. And in fact, regular British troops were obliged to hand over much of the face-to-face fighting to Māori allies because they were so much more effective in the bush. My own view is that it was those um, Māori kūpapa, the allies of the, of the government of the Crown, who led to a greater appreciation, greater respect for Māori after the wars were over. In fact, the reason Māori were guaranteed seats in Parliament and voting rights after the wars had a lot to do with the fact that many Māori had allied themselves with the Crown. But this leads into another weird twist in white supremacist history. After the New Zealand wars, it became very popular for Pākehā to feel very proud about the quality of their race relations with Māori. This is a thread which continues today. And it's partly justified. You don't see the same horrific exterminations which happened in Australia. We didn't set up a slave-based economy like the southern United States. But that is a ridiculously low bar to aim for. And Scott Hamilton says Pākehā, who claimed New Zealand was some kind of beacon for race relations in the late 1800s, were basically delusional. I think that is wishful thinking completely. And uh, another interesting phenomenon that we get uh, in the period um, in the 1870s and the 1880s is the beginning of the Pacific slave trade on a very large scale, um, which, you know, completely puts a lie to the notion that... uh, New Zealand wasn't uh, as racist as as America or one of the other slave trading countries. But um, that's another area of history which is just beginning to to be opened. I mean, my book, uh, Bridget Williams' book in 2016, The Stolen Island, I talk about New Zealand's involvement in the slave trade, the fact that we uh, raided an island in the south of Tonga, Ata, and completely depopulated it, sold the slaves to Peru, the fact that dozens of ships from this country were contributing to the blackbirding trade, where we were kidnapping islanders from Melanesia, taking them to the sugar plantations in Australia. And in fact, there is... um, irrefutable evidence that Melanesian slaves were at work in Auckland in the 1870s. We know that at least one cargo load of them arrived from Vanuatu, or the New Hebrides as it was then known. Um, So this notion that New Zealand, the attitudes to race changed amongst Pākehā New Zealanders after the wars and sort of people mellowed, I think is absurd. But after the New Zealand wars, you do see some changes in white supremacy. It becomes more defensive. Now white people have control over New Zealand, they're afraid they'll lose it. Damon Salesa says this paranoia was being felt all over the European world. This belief that races rose and fell, and that if you observed one race rising, then it was only a matter of time before it would fall. And this was a really common sort of racial way of thinking in Europe. And when Europeans imagined what their fall looked like, Typically, they imagine the nation that would supplant or succeed the European race would be the Asian race, which often leads to very visceral responses towards any sort of sense that that may have begun, sensitised people to things like interracial marriage or the giving away of rights or restoring of rights to Asian peoples and so on. And this is something that's still a very popular belief today. I mean, you see some very virulent um, white supremacists sort of saying, look, I'm not racist. 
I don't think that white people are superior. I think that Asians are superior to white people and white people are superior to brown people. And, you know, it's just the way things are. It's not that I think my people are the best. I just said that I think some people are better than other people. Yeah. Well, sort of European racial thinking was never binary. It was never an us versus them. It was always hierarchical, that there was a hierarchy of races and that they could be organised from most advanced to least. These ideas were popular across political boundaries. The white supremacists weren't just extreme right-wing conservatives. They were also radical progressives. I mean, just look at the New Zealand Liberal Party. In the late 1800s, the Liberal government passed huge reforms. It fought for higher minimum wages, for union rights, for old age pensions. Some of its members helped women win the right to vote, although quite a few senior members were opposed. Here's how Liberal politician William Pember Reeves talked about the reforms of the late 1800s. The policies were the outcome of a belief that a young, democratic country, still almost free from the extremes of wealth and poverty, from class hatreds and fears and the barriers these create, supplies an unequalled field for safe and rational experiment in the hope of preventing and shutting out some of the worst social evils and miseries which afflict great nations alike in the old world and the new. It's an idealistic message, but these ideals had limits. And those limits were based on white supremacy. Here's Manying Ip, Professor of Asian Studies at the University of Auckland. On the one hand, you have got politicians who seem to be very egalitarian, you know, who wanted to protect the right of the working men, for example, all right, who wanted to uh, uh, protect workers. But at the same time, they were very, very anti-Chinese. Why? I mean, for, for no other reason but the fact that they were you know, an ethnic group that they did dislike. Some of the trade unions, in fact, you know, it um, could be very, very anti-Jewish and anti-Chinese because they, they, they felt that they are protecting the rights of the New Zealand honest bloke, you know. So Pakeha has really believed that they are really superior. We, we I mean, New Zealand was considered the better, uh, the better Britain of the South Pacific to be kept away from the yellow peril, to be kept away from any kind of contamination. Just to ram this point home, New Zealanders like to think that after women won the right to vote in 1893, we had universal suffrage. One person, one vote. That's not true. Up until 1951, the law was that no person of Chinese descent could be naturalised as a New Zealand citizen. In some cases, we're talking about people whose families have lived in this country for multiple generations. No Chinese could be naturalised. We could not apply for citizenship. That's right. Yeah. If the Chinese had no right to vote, why would any politicians stand for them? Why would there be any groups who would speak up for them? And I mean, one of the things I found most astonishing was that British New Zealand women, Pākehā women, could lose their voting rights if they married a Chinese man. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Yes. Because Chinese is um, nationality, you know, nationality-wise, is that if, if a, a, a New Zealand citizen, uh, that a British citizen, marry a Chinese person, then she would be considered Chinese. That was just one of many laws which targeted Chinese on the basis of maintaining racial purity. Farm owners had to set up separate accommodation for Chinese workers. There were poll taxes. Chinese women were barred from entering the country. They were depicted as heathens and they brought another kind of culture and then they brought uh, diseases and like leprosy, you know, tuberculosis, all sorts of undesirable things to New Zealand. So far, we've focused on how white supremacy affected Chinese and Māori. But in the 1800s, Pākehā racism included all kinds of groups. Dalmatians, Norwegians, Jews, Indians. And in the 1880s, Scott Hamilton says we also see the first evidence of Islamophobia in New Zealand. The target was hawkers travelling merchants who sold food and other goods along the roads of New Zealand. 
Nowadays, we go to the supermarket and buy things, but isolated communities in New Zealand in the late 19th and early 20th centuries relied a lot on travelling salespeople. Sometimes these people just pushed hand carts, sometimes they had horses and they pulled carts, and they used to sell clothing, they used to sell tinned food, they used to sell medicine, jewellery, and many of them were Syrians or Lebanese, and uh, almost always men, They'd left the Ottoman Empire, often to avoid the very draconian um, rules around compulsory military service that existed at the time, and uh, integrated, married into communities, produced descendants. The distinguished um, poet Roly Habib uh, was a descendant of a, a Syrian trader who married, um, married into a Maori family. Uh, but they did face considerable prejudice, and in the article for spin-off, I suggest that this might have been connected to the uh, almost hysterical reaction to the Mardist War in New Zealand. The Mardist War was a revolt in Sudan against the British colonialists who controlled the country. In 1885, a Muslim cleric called Muhammad Ahmad led a kind of holy war against the British and captured the city of Khartoum. His followers beheaded a famous British general, Charles George Gordon, who'd led the defence. This sort of put the notion of an aggressive and savage Islam on, 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 you know, into people's consciousness. The, the media really played up the notion that the Muslim followers of the Mahdi were, were fanatics and were bloodthirsty. And it's around about the time of the Mahdist panic that we have the first hawkers arriving. Certainly by the 1890s, you have newspapers and politicians speaking very negatively about the hawkers. They're um, accused of all sorts of misdeeds, lack of hygiene, dirtiness, um, spying on white housewives when their husbands are out working, uh, ripping off customers. And Dick Seddon, he's a premier in 1896, and he pushes a law through Parliament, a piece of legislation which makes it very difficult to work as a hawker in New Zealand unless you have uh, certificates in which four ratepayers attest to your honesty. And he was supported by um, William Pember Reeves, who made an extraordinary speech in support of the legislation uh, in which he talked about the the utter immorality of the the hawkers and the, the danger they presented to New Zealand. And he said that they were every bit as undesirable as Johnny Chinaman. So it's quite sobering to read these expressions of prejudice towards uh, people who came from the Middle East. I have to be sort of careful about assuming that all the hawkers were Muslims. It's quite quite likely that a significant number were Christian. Um, But they were certainly perceived as having an alien religion. And uh, I do think that this is perhaps the beginning of Islamophobia in New Zealand's history. There's been a lot of talk recently about how the incident in Christchurch represents a loss of innocence in New Zealand. And we've just been talking about how white supremacy has a long history in New Zealand, but it's true we've not seen anything quite like this before. But we have seen things that look a lot like it. In particular, the case of Lionel Terry in 1905. This is really the precursor uh, for the Christchurch terrorist. And there's a danger of um, talking about social media, talking about economic conditions in the 21st century, talking about the the nightmare that is contemporary America and its influence on New Zealand and forgetting our own history. And the parallels with what Lionel Terry did are really striking. Lionel Terry was a recent arrival in New Zealand. He'd lived most of his life in Britain and in other British colonies. Along the way, he picked up a deep hatred and fear of Chinese people. And while he was in New Zealand, he turned these ideas into a kind of manifesto, a book called The Shadow. I'm not going to quote from this book, but you can imagine the kind of content I'm talking about. Paranoia that Asian people were corrupting the white races, stealing jobs from white workers, committing crimes, spreading disease. He'd walked from uh, far north of New Zealand all the way to... Wellington, about 900 miles, with this, you know, febrile polemic, uh, the shadow, which he was trying to sell by the roadside. Uh, He hadn't had a tremendous amount of success. He placed it in bookshops in Wellington, and he was walking about Wellington asking the booksellers how how it was selling, and they told him it was selling slowly. And he's supposed to have said to one of the bookshop owners, uh, it'll sell better tomorrow. 
and immediately after that he went out and he chose a victim and he, he shot this unfortunate man in, in Chinatown. Lionel Terry's victim was an old man, Joe Kum Young, a gold miner who'd worked in New Zealand more than 30 years before his leg was injured in an accident. The day after the shooting, Terry turned himself into the police and said this. I have come to tell you that I am the man who shot the Chinaman in the Chinese quarters of the city last evening. I take an interest in alien immigration and I took this means of bringing it under the public notice. Terry, you know, was very explicit about the fact that he committed murder for the sake of publicity. The disturbing thing, I think, is obviously Terry's action is disturbing, but equally disturbing is the way he became a folk hero very quickly. Um, after being ending up in a psychiatric hospital, um, he made a number of escapes. In 1907, he escaped, and he remained. He escaped from Seacliff Hospital near Dunedin, and he remained at large for months. And he was uh, sheltered and fed by some of the shepherds and the farmers in the interior of Otago. And the police are quite explicit in the reports they sent back. They said, look, it's really hard to catch this guy. Uh, no one wants to give him up. He's a hero down here. Uh, there was a petition, and uh, at least 3,000 people signed a petition asking for this um, racist murderer's release. This man, you know, enjoyed considerable support. This is the biggest difference between what happened in Christchurch in 2019 and what happened in Wellington in 1905. Modern New Zealanders have reacted to the attacks on mosques with utter horror and disgust. It's hard to imagine the accused killer getting any kind of support from the local community, let alone being sheltered from the police. And it's worth pointing out that even back in the 1900s, there were Pākehā who opposed the racist treatment of Chinese. And you can see some of that in the aftermath of another shooting, which happened in Dunedin a year after Lionel Terry's murder of Joe Kum Young. Here's how it was reported in the Otago Daily Times. A Chinaman named Lin Foon, armed with a six-chambered revolver and evidently having a determination to vindicate his race from such attacks as that made by Lionel Terry in Wellington, ran amuck in Walker Street, Dunedin, on October the 2nd. Rushing out of his house in Stafford Street and down Hope Street with murder in his eye and the loaded revolver in his hand, he encountered a man named Peter McEwen, at whom he fired two shots in quick succession. Luckily, only one of these bullets hit Peter McEwen. He was wounded in the leg, but he recovered in hospital. The newspaper went on to speculate about what motivated the shooting. It appears he was frequently subjected to assault and interference at the hands of hoodlums. Only some weeks ago, he had a rather severe encounter. So, from this newspaper story, it sounds like Lin Foon was lashing out against some really nasty racist abuse. Later newspaper stories suggest he was actually being chased at the time he shot Peter McEwen. Now, if Pākehā New Zealanders all thought like Lionel Terry and his supporters, you might expect the judge and jury to come down hard on Lin Foon. But that's not what happened. Lin Foon was convicted, but the jury gave a strong recommendation of mercy because of the way he had been, and I quote, frequently annoyed. I've got to say, the details of this case are really unclear from the newspaper reports I've read, so we should be careful about reading too much into it. But Manying Ip says it's not a totally isolated incident. There is a, a, some a degree of sympathy for the Chinese in in the parliament, for example, in the parliamentary debate, when the government wanted to pass anti-Chinese laws for the higher poll tax on the Chinese and so on, you see quite, quite a number of um, parliamentarians who would object to it. Yeah. I mean, do you think it's important to sort of look at that side of things too? Because I mean, I think there's, oh, yes. I, cause yes. I think there's a tendency for sort of people to say, look, everyone was racist back then, you know. No, 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 no. That, that, I, 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 I would be <laughs> to disagree that everyone was racist back then. No, no. Some 
lawyer, barrister, and so on and so forth would represent the Chinese pro bono when they were really downtrodden and, and took the case all the way to, to, to the Supreme Court. Yeah. So, so not everyone was racist, I would say. All through New Zealand history, we see groups and individuals within Pākehā society who dissent, who oppose white supremacy. They make up a small minority, but they're there. We see them in the early Communist Party and some religious organisations. But here's a twisty question for you. Is that a good thing? Because as Damon Celesa pointed out in a previous episode of Black Sheep, the fact these non-racist individuals exist really undermines the idea that white people couldn't help but be racist in the context of their time. You know, I, don't, I never quite buy, and we shouldn't buy, the people of their time argument. And every time we look at, the key ideas of the time are contested. And the idea that everyone in the world was racist in 1918 is simply false. You know, if you look around the world, there's many, many Europeans who are actively working against racism. The big global turning point for white supremacy is the Second World War. The Holocaust forced change. There were international efforts to condemn racism through the newly formed United Nations. We saw the rise of the civil rights movement in the United States. And Dr. Leone Pihama says Māori were part of that international movement. A lot of Māori uh, men came back from war and realised that actually they were not going to be treated in the same way as the others that they had been overseas with. So I think you saw in the kind of that post-war period a kind of growth and understanding and view that actually our fundamental rights as citizens were not going to be upheld. For Māori, you then, we then saw the uh, American Indian movement rise alongside the civil rights movement. And so all through the 70s, there's this kind of international context that is building with an awareness of fundamental civil rights and the breach of that. Now, if you take that alongside the movement towards things like the establishment of the Waitangi Tribunal in 1975, you've got a whole lot of things that intersect. At the same time, there were a lot of other big changes happening in New Zealand. Here's Professor Paul Spoonley from Massey University. Since the 1980s, he's been researching white supremacy in New Zealand. We were beginning to lose some of the stability and economic success that we'd seen in the 50s and 60s. So by the early 1970s, we get the significant rise in the number of unemployed as one indicator. The UK had joined the European Economic Community in 1973, and our privileged access was now being renegotiated. So it produced a degree of instability. And, of course, we'd seen the significant arrival of migrants from the Pacific. And by the 1970s, particularly by that 1975 election, they were being portrayed as being people who undermined law and order, who were taking our jobs, who were culturally and racially different from us as being the Pākehā. And it was a moment when we began to question our connections and our identity. And I think a useful endpoint or next stage really is 1981 and the Springbok Rugby Tour, which divided New Zealand in a way that really was um, enormously significant for the way in which we viewed who we were. A lot of Pākehā saw all these changes as threatening. They saw New Zealand losing its connection to Britain and to its colonial past. They felt they were losing power while Māori and non-white migrant communities were gaining power. And politicians played into these fears, particularly Prime Minister Robert Muldoon. He talked about, we are all New Zealanders. So in the face of the challenge of Māori to say, well, as, as, as Māori... Uh, There are rights that have never been recognised and which we were given under the Treaty of Waitangi. And Muldoon, of course, has got that famous phrase that he repeated on many occasions, we're all New Zealanders. It wasn't just talking points and it wasn't just Muldoon. 
The Labour government in the 1970s began rigidly enforcing immigration laws, particularly targeting Pacific communities. Police burst into homes with dogs and dawn raids. They stopped Pacific people at random in the street, demanding to see their papers. Academics who've studied these policies in more recent years found that 80% of people prosecuted for overstaying their visas were Polynesian. They actually only made up a third of overstayers. At the same time, we see the rise of modern white supremacist groups. In many ways, they were very traditional, very conservative in terms of what they saw as important in terms of values and institutions and practices. But then they took those views even further to the extreme by arguing for white supremacy, by arguing that people such as Māori or Pacifica were intellectually inferior, by arguing that some of the changes that had occurred about recognition of biculturalism and the Treaty of Waitangi were really undermining British institutions in the society. And what we saw were groups and individuals who copied what had occurred in, in the UK. The British National Party, which has no connection whatsoever with the New Zealand National Party, provided others with a set of arguments about why we needed to retain white supremacy and white genetic um, separation it, it was very, very explicit in terms of what was being argued here. We needed separate societies, even inside New Zealand. I began uh, researching these groups when I came back from the UK um, in the 1980s, and through the 1980s and 90s, I looked at 70 groups. I mean, they weren't, they weren't minor. There were a large number of groups and a relatively large number of people who affiliated with those groups. I mean, do you have an opinion on whether this is a new or an old thing? Because you're sort of pointing out that these are very traditionalist groups. And of course, a lot of the values that they are, that they are sort of holding to are very old values. I think they're a combination of old and new. The old bits are beliefs about the British Empire and the British race. The new bits were not that new, but they came from the 1930s and the rise of fascism. And you get this belief that the supremacy of the whites uh, was paramount, but it also needed to be accompanied by uh, racial separation and the management of these um, inferior, and I, quotation marks please, inferior groups um, by the dominant group in various ways. We didn't actually have many examples of fascism in New Zealand. Australia did, Canada did, the US did, and of course most of Europe did. Um, but they didn't arrive here. But by the 1960s, by the establishment of the first neo-Nazi group in 1967, we began to see the emergence of these groups harking back both to a colonial past, but also using the arguments of fascism, of European fascism. Since the attacks in Christchurch, lots of people have pointed out that we've often dismissed the significance of neo-Nazi groups in New Zealand. I personally remember getting phone calls from neo-Nazis when I was a very junior reporter in Christchurch, and I mostly just ignored them. They just seemed like a sad, deluded fringe. I probably should have been more aware about how dangerous these people could be. I mean... I was actually in court for the sentencing of the white supremacist who murdered the Korean backpacker Jae Hyong Kim. I sat right next to him at the media bench. These groups have at times, have at times been involved in violence. So the Fourth Reich, which was established at Paparua Prison in the mid-1990s, was involved in a number of deaths, and those deaths were the result of the ideologies that they hold. So they were racially motivated deaths, a uh, Korean backpacker, gay man, Māori man, and so on. I, at the time, struggled um, to say to some people, you know, this is an example of 
a part of the community that we tend to overlook and perhaps at times tend to deny as being part of our community, but they are, and here they have attacked and killed a Korean backpacker. This is significant in and of itself. So if we come back to the to the shootings in Christchurch, a dreadful moment in our history, it would be quite easy to say, no, the person's Australian or they're a lone wolf, but that rather misses the point, and that is that even at the extremes, we have a history of people in this country holding those views and at times being involved in violence, sometimes verbal, sometimes physical, and sometimes death, which we really do need to acknowledge because it holds a mirror up to all of us and it asks some questions about what we, what did we do to try and understand and prevent such occurrences. So I want to leave you with a few more thoughts from the historians we've talked to here. Because I have to admit, I was having a bit of an existential crisis when I was making this program. I wasn't sure that it actually does any good to look at the history of New Zealand through this lens. I asked Manning Ip why she thought it was important to examine the mistakes of our past. Anything that is wrong should not be just swept under the carpet and, 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 and then left unexamined. We, we don't want everyone to think that we are New Zealanders, okay, it is a, a, a paradise on earth. It has got every opportunity to become a, a very good place, you know. That, that, I mean, I'm always optimistic on this one. I mean, if any country is going to get it right, New Zealand should be the country who can get it right, you know. Um, so we need to come out and say unequivocally that this is wrong and we must not repeat it. Why we need to examine it is that we don't want to repeat it. Mark Darby says another reason to look at this history is to see how far we've come. I think even looking back just a few years to uh, language used by um, a politician like Richard Pribble who referred to prospective Muslim migrants to this country as illiterate camel drivers, I don't think that language like that would be permissible in Parliament today, even just a few years later. And I welcome that, uh, that change. I think we need to celebrate that. We need to remind ourselves that these actions are a ghastly throwback that is utterly unacceptable. On the other hand, Dr Leonie Pihama warns against complacency. The idea that we have good race, race relations in Aotearoa is an ongoing mythology that we've had since very early in our colonial history. And there are times that we do. There are times that we do come together, I think, very powerfully, and they're often in times of extreme trauma, like we've seen in the past week. So I think what happens is that we then go into this kind of selective memory, and after a period of time, that dissolves away and we go back in to the same old process that we were beforehand. And that, I think, is what we can't allow to happen this time. Finally, you might have seen a bit of debate around a phrase that's been circulated since the Christchurch shooting. This is not us. I asked Damon Salesa what he thought about that sentiment. I think it's a really important message for this moment because it calls us to our kind of better selves. But as many, many New Zealanders know firsthand, and certainly through their memories and histories, New Zealand has a long track record of you know, what we could in this context call white supremacist thought and practice. So yes, it's, it is an important aspirational statement, and it's an important statement that allows us to grieve and come to terms with this traumatic event. And I think we have to acknowledge the importance of that, that this is also a call to our future. But we shouldn't forget that New Zealand was erected and came into being as part of an empire and that that empire had as one of its cornerstones a commitment to white supremacy. (laughs) 
special thanks to all my guests on today's show. If this is your first time listening to Black Sheep, you might want to go back and have a listen to some of our previous episodes. You can find them by searching on an app like Apple Podcasts or Spotify or Stitcher. You can also find this series from the series and podcast page at rnz.co.nz. And on that same page, there's another podcast you should really listen to. It's called Public Enemy, and it was produced by Muhammad Hassan. Muhammad created that series a few years ago to look at how negative attitudes towards Muslims developed both overseas and in New Zealand in the wake of 9-11. It's an amazing piece of work, and I really recommend you listen to it if you haven't already. Black Sheep is written and presented by me, William Ray. The executive producer is Tim Watkin, and our sound engineer is William Saunders. We had voice acting help from Duncan Smith, Robert Kelly, and James Kane. Hi, icons. It's Danny Pellegrino from the pop culture podcast, Everything Iconic, and I love Nordstrom. No place better to shop, particularly during the holiday season, because they have everything. They have holiday decor at Nordstrom. They have cozy cardigans from Barefoot Dreams, my fave. They have cold weather attire, party attire, plus free shipping and free returns, free store pickup. You can also purchase a recycled fabric gift bag so your item arrives festive and wrapped. So check out Nordstrom this holiday season, a one-stop shop. You can explore more at Nordstrom in-store or online at Nordstrom.com.